I'm Mike Ross. Here's a segment from our show, Live from Studio 5, that airs weekdays from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on AMI-audio. Last fall, Canada's parliament voted unanimously to declare the Rohingya crisis a genocide. It was the first government in the world to make such a declaration. Yesterday, legal experts and human rights scholars gathered at the University of Ottawa to talk about invoking the UN Convention on Genocide as a way to prosecute Myanmar's leaders. Farid Khan is the Director of Advocacy and Media Relations for the Rohingya Human Rights Network, and he joins us now on the phone from Ottawa. Morning, Farid. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's always good to have you on the program. So, Farid, as Corinne mentioned off the top, the Canadian Parliament is the only Parliament in the world to refer to this as a genocide. The question then begs to be asked, why have other countries refrained from doing so? Uh, well, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, I have no answer for that. Um, the only thing I can speculate on is that if you look at the world today, there is a lot of chaos and violence going on. Aside from the Rohingya in uh, in Myanmar, you've got now the Uyghurs in China. You've got a uh, war in Yemen that's created the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. You've got, um, obviously, the political chaos in the U.S. And the U.S. has generally been a leader on these sorts of things. And without that leadership, it seems that uh, the nations of the world that uh, usually are leading the charge on this sort of thing, um, they don't have a captain to uh, follow. Well, it has been a few months since the House of Commons and the Canadian Senate declared what was happening to the Rohingya people to be genocide. Do you have any idea as to why nothing's been done? Well, um once again, uh, it depends on uh, you know how you look at it. We we worked for over a year to try and get the government not only to uh, recognize the genocide in uh, Myanmar, but also to revoke Aung San Suu Kyi's honorary Canadian citizenship, which also happened at the same time. And and they were both important symbolic victories. However, now we've got the government uh, uh, delaying and hesitating, and equivocating, and. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at what's on the government's plate, uh, you know, that might give you an answer. You know, they're, they're dealing with the issue of things like pipelines. They're dealing with, uh, you know, the deficit. They're dealing with a whole host of issues. And uh, unfortunately, the issues of human rights, whether it's the, the Rohingya or any other group, these are not ballot box issues. These are not issues that uh, drive the votes of Canadians, sadly. And uh, so, you know, when it comes to placing it in the a list of priorities, um, I can only say that uh, maybe it just doesn't rank as high. It's important because, obviously, um, because Canada's been going around the world talking about its uh, commitment to human rights and, and rule of law, but when it comes to taking action, it takes far too long. And unfortunately, um, for any group that's dealing on human rights issues internationally, diplomacy, uh, international politics and diplomacy are very uh, slow processes, sadly. That's true. Now, I want to turn our attention to an event that took place yesterday at the University of Ottawa. You had a speaker. Can you tell us more about him and what he spoke about? Yes, uh, this was Professor Jan Wouters. He is uh, an international scholar from the University of Leuven's in uh, in uh, Belgium. Um, he has consulted with the International Criminal Court, with the International Court of Justice. He teaches in uh, the area of international law. And uh, I mean, if you look him up, his his credentials are just amazing. Anyway, he was presenting. Um, he's here in town, actually, a guest lecturing for a short while at the University of Ottawa. And he did a special presentation on the case of invoking the UN Genocide Convention in the case of the um, uh, Rohingya. And uh, the case that he made was that uh, given the fact that Canada is the only nation in the world that has recognized the genocide uh, of the Rohingya, the fact that it was unanimously voted on in both houses of parliament, um, and uh, Canada has made these statements uh, about uh, standing up for international rule of law and human rights, and no one else is stepping forward, then it is incumbent upon Canada then to take the next logical step, which is to present a case at the um, at the International Court of Justice. Well, now, can one country move the issue to the United Nations for debate? Well, this is not uh, the United Nations. This is uh, the International Court of Justice, which uh, is in Europe. 
And yes, one country can. Both Canada and Myanmar are parties to the um, uh, UN Genocide Convention. And uh, th- by the very fact that uh, Canada has recognized the genocide means that they are on opposite sides of the issue. And uh, any single party... Uh, who has ratified, signed that treaty, the Genocide Convention, can in fact then take it to the International Court of Justice. It doesn't require a vote in the United Nations. It doesn't require, um, you know, gathering a coalition of the willing, although that would obviously be a better case. Uh, you know, one country can basically say, um, you know, the, this so-and-so country has violated the UN Genocide Convention in such and such a case, and therefore we are, you know, uh, filing a brief with the uh, International Court of Justice. And it wouldn't be the first time something like that has uh, been done. In fact, uh, Belgium um, had uh, used the terms of the Genocide Convention against Senegal uh, a number of years back. So there, there is precedent. And plus, the uh, tribunals in the case of both Rwanda and Yugoslavia and the actually put forth case law that, uh, you know, compels Canada to uh, invoke the Genocide Convention. Right. So as you said, this is clearly there's precedent here as well as uh, incentive for Canada to take that next step. But what would change on the ground should the International Court of Justice get involved? Well, uh, at the very start, the ICJ could uh, issue an interim uh, order or interim uh, sanctions of some sort against the um, against the government of Myanmar, and it would start a process. The fact is that what is happening in Myanmar, it's not just about the Rohingya, it's about the whole region and the expulsion of the Rohingya and the mass killings, which are still ongoing. The, the, the persecution of the Rohingya, by the way, is still ongoing. That genocide is still ongoing in Myanmar. There are uh, up to 400,000 um, Rohingya still in Myanmar. About 140,000 of them are in what can only be described as concentration camps, where every aspect of their lives is controlled. Even the, even the decision on, you know, whether you you can uh, have children it has to be approved and they are living in starvation conditions so this is not over it's not as if the the genocide is done it is still ongoing so the the need to invoke it is still there it's urgent and uh, um, it would begin a process if if uh, this move forward that uh, would then allow an end goal to be in sight. Um, unfortunately, once again, as I said, it's a slow process, but even the uh, Rohingya themselves have called on the invoca- called for the invocation of the Genocide Convention. So it's not just that it's some Western country saying this needs to be done. Even one of the main national Rohingya organizations of the world, uh, the uh, Arakan Rohingya National Organization, has called for the invocation of the Genocide Convention. So... If this is declared the Rohingya, the crisis, a genocide, uh, would there be troops sent in? What, what, what would happen next? Well, that uh, would then be up to the uh, uh, UN. Um, the 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 legal side of it is separate from the the, the political side of it. So, if if uh, the genocide uh, invoking the treaty was uh, commenced, then there would obviously be a whole host of other uh, political decisions that would have to be made, and that would take place at the UN. And of course, uh, at the UN, you have the issue of the um, the veto nations and. In the case of uh, Myanmar, um, China has been very quick to veto anything that uh, has come forth. So it is going to be a process that uh, obviously is not going to be an easy one. Um, There are going to be uh, hurdles that still have to be um, crossed, and, uh, uh, you know, it'll be time-consuming. But for the Rohingya, what it means is that there is a process of seeking justice that has commenced, and eventually the goal is to have them return to a safe place of their own volition, um, to a safe place where they can live their lives without threat of persecution. You know, as we've been speaking, I've been racking my brains. Now, bear in mind, I might have missed it, but I don't really feel feel like this issue has been getting a lot of attention in the media recently. I know it made headlines a lot a few months ago, but not as much nowadays. How do you feel about the media coverage? Well, um, you're right. It hasn't been receiving much media coverage. There's, uh, you know, the odd uh, um, story here and there. But, um, you know, uh, 
for the people in the media, obviously there's a lot of stories happening, and, and one of the things that seems to suck the oxygen out of the room pretty much every day is what's coming out of uh, Washington, D.C. and the White House. Um, we've got uh, that. Uh, we've got uh, you know issues of, for example, Russia. Uh, we've now got our own uh, you know, sort of a diplomatic conflict with, between Canada and China. And in that sort of a media environment, it's very difficult to um, get attention for, I think, a very serious issue, which has long-term implications, not just for the Rohingya, but for other similar conflicts in the world. Um, it uh, presents a problem. And, uh, you know, so we at the Rohingya Human Rights Network and and others have been trying to keep this on the public agenda and on the media agenda as much as we can. And, and so, you know, for that, we actually thank you uh, and organizations like yours, uh, other media organizations who actually take an interest in this issue because it brings attention to still, you know, a crisis of people that are suffering and being persecuted. Uh, sticking with awareness, what is what else is being done? You've just mentioned about uh, talking to places like in the media and such, but is there anything else being done to raise awareness for the issue? Well, yes. Back uh, every time there's an opportunity, we do try and bring attention to the um, issue. Back in uh, uh, December on Human Rights Day, we made a uh, media statement uh, which got some coverage, you know, calling on the government to uh, invoke the uh, Genocide uh, Convention. We had this presentation yesterday, which was quite well attended, you know, had actually quite a few um, representatives from um, various embassies in Ottawa who attended, who are taking interest. Uh, I myself had a conversation with uh, um, a gentleman from the Turkish embassy. Turkey is taking a very strong interest in this, so we're trying to ally ourselves with other um, organizations and nations who um, may be able to push this issue forward, not only in terms of Canadian government action, but also on the diplomatic front. There's a major uh, conference happening in New York um, at the beginning of February to uh, to discuss this issue that's going to be attended by um, uh, uh, scholars and, and various uh, government officials from around the world. Um, so there are actions happening, but they're happening in the background. And once again, they don't get the coverage that uh, they deserve um, when you're trying to compete with so many different uh, you know, media stories from uh, around the world. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, Fareed, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Well, thank you for once again covering this issue. Marie Khan, the Director of Advocacy and Media Relations for the Rohingya Human Rights Network. We reached him on the phone in Ottawa. You've been listening to Live from Studio 5.